Well, we are honored to be joined this morning um, by Dr. Shin Bei, who is a, a neurologist uh, by training, but really focuses on vestibular disorders and migraine disorders. Um, he did his uh, residency training at UT Southwestern and has done um, post-residency fellowship training at um, Johns Hopkins and um, New York University. He has um, established a, a dizzy clinic um, in Texas and is, has also published multiple books, um, many of which our patients have found helpful for vestibular migraine in particular. Um, and so we're very excited to have him join us today and share some of his wisdom with us, uh, because as we all know, these patients can be challenging um, and, and we all have a lot to learn about it. So thank you so much. And we're looking forward to your presentation. Pleasure, pleasure. Sorry, I'm a bit hoarse, a bit congested. The Rona got me finally. Three years, I was fine. And it finally got me. Yep. <clears throat> These are my disclosures, nothing much. Um, all medication use uh, will be uh, off-label, unfortunately. Not a single medication on the planet is uh, proof of vestibular migraine. Um, as you said, you know, vestibular migraine can be a bit painful, um, especially for, um, you know, actually most physicians, it'll be painful for them. Once the patient complains of dizziness, vertigo, I think everyone experiences a little bit of that ugh, type of feeling. I, on the other hand, was a bit masochistic. So, you know, it drew, it drew me towards the field. Right, so vestibular migraine, the prevalence initially was estimated at about 1% of the adult population. But a more recent study looked at it, and it's actually closer to about 3%. It is the second most common cause of vertigo in adults right after BPPV. Um, there is a very, very, very strong female preponderance for uh, vestibular migraine. When you look at the studies, you know, it ranges the lowest, you know, being one and a half times more than men. But on the uh, higher side, we see it going all the way up to almost six. Typically, it starts in the late 30s to about 40s. And patients do have a history of uh, migraine headache and motion sickness. So a typical patient that you would see with vestibular migraine would be, you know, a lady she had in her late teens, 20s perhaps, you know, had migraine, right, migraine headaches, you know, they'll tell you, like, you know, during the periods they had the uh, headaches. Um, and then as they approach, you know, perimenopause, you know, the headaches start to fall off, but then the vestibular symptoms tend to set in from there. Most people also have a family history of migraine, and some actually have a, a family history of uh, vestibular migraine. There are many, many names, you know, as you all are aware, you know, there's migraine as vertigo, vertiginous migraine, migraine associated vertigo, my favorite migraine associated dizziness, MAD, migraine related vestibulopathy, benign recurrent vertigo. But now the preferred term, of course, is uh, vestibular migraine that helps, um, you know, streamline the diagnosis a little bit more. Um, so the question that a lot of people will ask is, you know, so if you have migraine and you're dizzy, does that automatically mean you have vestibular migraine, right? So 55% of people with migraine complain of some vestibular symptoms, whether it's uh, dizziness, you know, or vertigo. So for vestibular migraine, there are diagnostic criteria. So this is a clinical diagnosis. There is no uh, test that can be performed to uh, make the diagnosis unfortunate, right? So usually the patient should have, you know, a current or previous uh, history of migraine with or without aura they have to experience at least five episodes of vestibular symptoms of moderate to severe intensity. Moderate meaning it should impair the activities of daily living. Severe, you know, can completely cannot perform activities of daily living. Each episode can range between five minutes to up to 72 hours. At least 50% of the episodes have to have at least one migraine symptom, right? It can be the headache. The headache should be, you know, have, you know, one of uh, two characters, sorry, must have at least two characteristics, you know, throbbing, pulsating type of headache, one side of the head or aggravated by, you know, routine activity. So this is one of those headaches, unlike a tension headache, where you can push through, right? Like I'm you know, just mentioning you in surgery after 3 a.m. And I'm sure you had a tension headache, you can push you up to that point. But with a migraine, you cannot really push. The more you push, the worse it gets. Um, photophobia and phonophobia, you know, together, which is light and noise sensitivity or the visual aura. And of course, as with every diagnostic criteria, no other explanation. Vestibular migraine has been with us for a very, very long time. Right? You know, the association between migraine symptoms and vertigo have gone all the way back to the ancient Greeks and the ancient Chinese. In fact, ancient Chinese texts, you know, looked at perhaps, you know, Meniere's disease, where there is ear pressure, fluctuating hearing, tinnitus as well. But as we see here, you know, not much attention was paid to vestibular migraine. Until the 1990s, you know, there was a little bit of an increase in uh, interest 
the German group, uh, Dr. Stroop's group, you know, published some um, papers on vestibular migraine. At that time, they, they were the first, I believe, to use the term vestibular migraine. And so then more interest came into play. And by 2012, that is when the uh, diagnostic criteria um, were formalized, right? By the uh, Barani Society and the International Headache Society. And then from there, we see an increase in the number of publications for vestibular migraine. However, you know, it's still very, very, very underdiagnosed. You know, this was the very recent paper that just came out. They looked at 106 patients who presented to their PCPs, um, presented to the ER, you know, non-neurotologists. And they found that, you know, of the, all the patients that were diagnosed with vestibular migraine, so 31 altogether, most of them, 16 of these patients, had no diagnosis specified whatsoever. And only four had an accurate diagnosis of this whole bunch. So a typical case, right, that we often see, a complicated case, you know, you know, the House Institute, I'm sure you see some really complex cases, right? And, you know, 43-year-old woman is based on a patient that I have seen. Right? She has a history of migraine, a visual and sensory aura since she was about 25, maybe about six per year, takes an approxen every time she has one, goes away, no issues. She got involved in a car accident at about 36. And within a month, she began to be constantly dizzy. Visually, everything bothered her. Every time she moved her head, side to side, especially up and down, she would make her more dizzy. She also, on top of that, developed these episodes of increased dizziness, right? Together with feeling off balance, not able to walk properly, feeling that she was swaying side to side, head pressure, light and noise sensitivity, sensitivity to smell, bilateral tinnitus and ear pressure. These last up to three days and occur about three times per month. Usually happen around her period, you know, when if there were excessive, you know, visual stimuli, like she was at the computer for too long, you know, looking at, you know, things moving around too much, going to Costco on a Saturday morning, not enough sleep, weather changes, usually storm front approaching, and of course, stress. She's been housebound because her vestibular symptoms have been so bad for the last three and a half years. And as with a lot of patients, they go to see multiple providers to find a diagnosis. So these are the list of some other people that she saw in some of the diagnosis and stuff that was done. Right? ENTs, neurologists, you know, some said BPPV, Meniere's, vestibular migraine brought up. Um, neurologists suggested, you know, thoracic outlet syndrome, seizures, migraine, occipital neuralgia, did nerve blocks, nothing else, right? Uh, neurosurgeons basically shrugged their shoulders, said, meh, nothing they can do, sent her off. So an endocrinologist, everything was okay. Two TMJ specialists, one said not TMJ, the other one said it's TMJ-induced vestibulopathy. Neurooptometrists didn't know what was happening. Vestibular therapy, you know, from two uh, providers. Um, a little bit of dry needling from a physical therapist. This surgeon decided it's uh, hyperparathyroidism and did surgery on her. Urologists were like, nope, nothing to do with us. Hematologist said it could be anemia. Um, retinal specialist said that her retina was normal. Psychologist and psychiatrist said that she had anxiety and depression. So she wanders away, you know, over to the more esoteric, you know, realms. Now. Right? She sees the chiropractors. She sees functional neurologists, quantum neurologists, whatever they are, chiropractic neurologists, and of course they give all kinds of weird diagnoses which we never learn about, like the escape left cerebellum. Where did it go? We don't know. Right. And they do, you know, the infrared therapy shining lights at her, you know, hoping to cure her. The weirdest one was, you know, she told me a chiropractic neurologist was pouring cold water over the right side of her body to stimulate the left cerebellum. Um, an MD who claims to be a neurotologist, immunologist, and genomic specialist gave her a bunch of IV stuff, did some gene testing. And as you can see, it started to go a little bit insane from there. Work up essentially normal, except a little bit of spontaneous nystagmus with fixation with move from the goggles, as you can see here. Very subtle, but we see that, you know, fairly often. Nothing to worry about most of the time. And so we diagnosed, we diagnosed her with, you know, vestibular migraine and triple PD. So let's talk about the symptoms of vestibular migraine in more detail, right? So a lot of uh, confusion arises as to what sort of vestibular symptoms a patient may experience in vestibular migraine. And I like this, you know, a little bit, a oh. little slight because it shows all the vestibular symptoms that a person with vestibular migraine can experience. There's this spinning, that sensation, they're flying through the air, rocking, swaying, lightheadedness, feeling as if they're bobbing, you know, sliding, floating, you know, all these symptoms. They feel some even report oscillopsia where, you know, everything is jiggling around. Some people, you know, have visually induced dizziness. Some people have head motion induced dizziness. Every time they move their head, it makes them feel um, dizzy or gives them vertigo. 
in our study, we showed that, you know, when patients complain about at least three symptoms most of the time, you know, three different vestibular symptoms. So they can have spinning, feel as if the ground is shifting under them, or they are dizzy, you know, feel all you know, kind of lightheaded, but every time they move their head, they experience spinning, a variety. And so this adds to the uh, confusion when it comes to the diagnosis, because some patients, they'll describe like one to one person, and they describe, describe another thing to a different person. You also can see a variety of neurological findings during, you know, the attacks, right? So if you see a patient during a vestibular migraine attack, they have a huge variety of, um, you know, present uh, findings. You can have, you know, usually nystagmus. It could be spontaneous, positional, mixed. Um, you can have issues with pursuit, and you can even detect sometimes, you know, VOR deficits of choleric testing or with the uh, vehicle. This is a patient we uh, recorded during an attack, as you can see here, a bit of uh, right breathing nystagmus during the attack. And in this one, you can see there is subtle downbeat nystagmus during the attack. This one is a fairly dramatic one. This one has uh, geotropic position on the stacks uh, during the attack. This was laying her head to the right, and then we see to the left, it beats to the left. Now, interestingly in her, during the, uh, sorry, in between the attacks, she has apal geotropic position on the stack, so it beats in the opposite direction. So the question then would be, you know, when does vertigo occur during the uh, migraine attack, right? You have the prodrome phase, which leads up to the migraine attack. You have the aura phase. You have the headache phase, you know, which is the main part of the attack as it resolves and the postdrome. It's about 24, 48 hours after the attack, right? And the answer is vestibular symptoms can occur at any time during a migraine attack. Headache can come with vestibular migraine, but I think an important point to emphasize here is that the headache frequency and severity decreases with age. And there is this very inconsistent relationship between vestibular migraine attacks and headache. If you look at the studies, you know, the reported association ranges anywhere from 24% of the time to 75% patients, right? Um, often the headache is not as severe as previous migraine headache. The vertigo often becomes the most bothersome symptom for these patients. Um, so it's important in these cases to look for other migraine features. Remember, the diagnostic criteria for vestibular migraine does not require the presence of headache. Headache is one of the migraine features that you can use to diagnose vestibular migraine. More often, not in my personal experience and the study we published, Photophobia, phonophobia are more prominent. And a small number of patients, they also get a typical visual aura. Visual aura of migraine, you know, they can describe seeing like lights flashing in their vision, black spots moving around. Some get, you know, squiggly lines, zigzag lines in their vision, or the more uh, classic one, they call that a fortification spectra. So it's like a little jagged C that starts in one corner of the vision and spreads across the visual field. Oral symptoms are extremely common as well in my experience with uh, patients. Our study showed about a quarter of them, but you know, lately I'm seeing more patients with um, oral symptoms. Tinnitus, not uncommon. Um, ear pressure, ear fullness can be seen as well. You know, some patients report a little bit of trouble hearing during the attacks, ear pain, and the weird, some other weird stuff that they also described as a little bubbling feeling, you know, pulsating feeling like vibrations inside the ear. Um, <clears throat> they tend to describe that as well. I think. There's also some emerging um, studies uh, from, I always get it confused, I think RISC and uh, Jalilian's group, they're showing that, you know, um, oral pressure, ear fullness is um, becoming more of a migraine uh, sign. So the question that some neurologists will ask is, you know, why, you know, why not diagnose these patients with migraine with brainstem or, right, if they have, you know, hearing symptoms, if they get vertical. But remember, the classification for migraine with brains, the, the International Headache Society, the diagnostic criteria states that, you know, people with migraine with brainstem aura, or the old name basilar migraine, should have the typical aura associated with at least two reversible brainstem symptoms. And this can be any of them, the vertigo, tinnitus, you know, changes in hearing, double vision, ataxia, changes in conscious level. Right. The aura, the definition of an aura is pretty strict. It has to last five to 60 minutes, accompanied or followed by a headache. Right. In patients with vestibular migraine, very rarely does it the vertigo and the dizziness follow this criteria. Most of the time, it lasts 
the duration of the migraine attack. The question then would be, of course, with migraine, uh, Meniere's disease, right? And, you know, this is the Yol's realm. realm. Um, and there is a lot of overlap with uh, Meniere's disease, you know, and migraine. So 50% of people with Meniere's have migraine, and there's a ton of overlap in the symptoms. To make matters even more interesting, you know, every time you have a Meniere's attack, you can also experience a migraine attack afterwards, right? Anything that gives you vertigo can trigger a migraine attack. The risk of Meniere's disease is two times higher in people with migraine, and the opposite is true. So people who have been diagnosed with uh, migraine have a uh, you know two, twi uh, two times higher risk of being diagnosed with Meniere's disease as well. Uh, so with vestibular migraine, the relationship gets even more complex, right? There's a lot of overlap between the two. Um, the stuff that I use to kind of help differentiate the two a little bit is the main thing is the uh, you know unilateral low frequency hearing loss. If that's there, then you know I cannot like, uh, exclude Meniere's disease. But most of the time, the patients who come to see us with vestibular migraine, they tend, if they have some hearing loss, it tends to be fairly symmetrical, very you know, high, usually high frequency and pretty mild in uh, most patients. The thing too is you know your chances of encountering you know not, not for you all because you see a lot of Meniere's disease, but you know for others you know the chances of encountering somebody with Meniere's disease is much lower than the chances of you encountering somebody with vestibular migraine. The um, Female preponderance in Meniere's also is lower than that of uh, vestibular migraine. The vertigo attacks tend to last, you know, usually according to criteria, about 20 minutes to 12 hours. And so a patient comes in with vertigo attacks that last two days, three days, you know, the likelihood of it being Meniere's disease, I would say, is fairly low. Other symptoms can also occur. These are not part of the diagnostic criteria, but you know, patients may describe them as well. Brain fog or trouble thinking, fatigue, emotional issues. You know, some even they get autonomic stuff, they're sweaty, they get dry mouth, diarrhea, a lot of yawning, you know, tear production, they get all pale, loss of appetite. Weird non, you know, specific type of um, sensory symptoms can be experienced as well, like tingling, you know, in the face, you know, tingling over the body, sometimes even pain in the body. Um, a lot of visual symptoms also may be uh, described to mainly blurriness. You know, it's not double vision. Most cases, they just say, you know, so as if they're wearing the wrong pair of glasses, kind of looks a little, you know, fuzzy. Um, some describe eye strain, so like well, pain in the muscles of their eye, if they try to read something. Visual snow is when they see, you know, everything kind of looks pixelated, little dots in their vision, like one of those uh, old TVs with uh, static Palinopsia is rare, um, but, but what it is is, you know, if you look at something, you look away, you see the object repeating in the vision. Um, Alice in Wonderland syndrome is an interesting one. Um, you know, a lot of patients who experience that, you know, they don't really want to tell you because they think that you will call them crazy, right? So in this case, you know, you have basically what it is, is distortions of sensory processing. Right. We can be most of the time it's visual. So patients describe, you know, objects appearing larger, micropsia, or smaller than they are, micropsia. Sometimes they have, you know, teleopsia, where things appear further away than they are, closer than they should be. Paropsia is when they see a stationary object suddenly start moving, you know, flying away. A kind of topsia is when they feel that, you know, um, things that should be moving when they look at them don't appear to be moving. This chromatopsia also can happen where, you know, there is um, alterations in perceptions of color. Usually they say, you know, everything appears a certain color. If a patient's describe, you know, everything looks blue, everything looks yellow, you know, or red. Uh, Dolly Zoom is a weird one. It's um, Alfred Hitchcock used that effect a lot in his um, movie. You know, so what they do is, you know, as you are, you know, moving your camera, the camera away from an object, you have, um, you zoom into the object. So it looks this weird type of um, perception there. Some describe as if, you know, things look as if they are viewing things from underwater. Split vision is where everything appears split in half. Uh, polyopia is, you know, kind of like diplopia on steroids. You see multiple images. Zoopsia is an interesting one. You see animals in your vision. Uh, closed eye visual hallucinations is when they close their eyes, they see random pictures. I have one patient whose you know, migraine symptoms were weird. She said that she would see a family completely unfamiliar to her, you know, down to the clothes that they were wearing and everything, just walking around her house, you know, and sitting down on things, you know, wouldn't say anything to her, just walk around when she had a migraine attack. 
sometimes you get distortions of body image or some aesthetic distortion. So they can feel as if their bodies are growing larger, becoming small. Sometimes it is the whole body. Sometimes it's just part of the body. So your patients describe like their necks growing longer, you know, the hands feel as if they don't belong to them. Um, you have a patient who says that, you know, she feels like a munchkin because her legs shrink you know, when she has um, her migraine attacks. A lot tend to describe out of body experiences too. They feel as if they're outside their body, looking at themselves. You know, derealization may also occur when things don't appear real. You know, or they don't appear real. They're not. They feel as if they're not real. Depersonalization. Um, good description that patient uh, told me was they feel as if they're on a movie set. You know, everyone was in on uh, what was happening except them, and they didn't know what was going on. As as if they're just watching actors. Auditory distortions also may occur, you know, changes in the volume, or you may hear certain pitches, you know, changing um, distortions of time and speed, a little bit more uh, unusual, but can also happen. So they feel as if things are moving faster than they are, slower than they should be. Yep. Oh, that was the, uh, what was that? That's the dolly zoom effect. I thought the thing didn't work. So as you zoom into the object, you're moving all your camera away. Okay, so... What about the patient that's dizzy all the time? So we talked about episodic you know, symptoms in people with uh, vestibular migraine, but I'm sure you all encounter patients who are dizzy all the time. And they describe you know, things like you know, visual stimuli being overwhelming for them when they go to hotels with ugly rugs, when they go to the um, supermarket, when they're driving past a row of trees, talk to people like me who move around to them much, scrolling on the computer, scrolling on the cell phone, things like that. So what could that B. So, you know, you have a ton of other things that can overlap with vestibular migraine. What I tell patients, you know, I quote my old mentor, right? Some dogs have ticks, some dogs have fleas, and some dogs have ticks and fleas. And so some patients have ticks and fleas, right? So you can have triple PD and PDS, you know, some have a lot of motion sickness, motion sensitivity, and visual height intolerance as well, or fear of heights, right? A lot of patients also describe, even if they're not having an attack, they're very sensitive to, you know, stimuli, right? So light sensitivity to smells to noises may occur as well. There is a huge overlap with a lot of psychiatric comorbidities. And so the danger here is, you know, we all, we may just um, diagnose them as having anxiety or depression and not pay attention to what could be called the anxiety and depression. About seventy percent of patients with you know vestibular migraine have anxiety, um, depression, and about forty percent. Um, Teji's group in Italy did an interesting study. They went into the yes, um, mental institutions and um, talked to patients. Those who described dizziness were often the anxious patients, whereas those admitted for depression very rarely described dizziness. Now, some also have you know certain phobic disorders like acrophobia, you know, <clears throat> fear going, you know, fear, you, you know, and then claustrophobia, agoraphobia as well. Psychogenic disorders, you know, a lot of neurologists may encounter that. And this is usually the result of, you know, a lack of diagnosis, right? Um, the old term for psychogenic disorders, of course, is uh, hysteria. Now we prefer, I think the new term is functional neurological disorders. So you have tremors that are non-organic feelings of weakness. Um, astasia aphasia is, you know, no stance, no base. It's those weird type of walks that they are present to you, right? <clears throat> Some even have, like, you know, so one of the patients also had like a language disorder, like that she spoke in a foreign accent when she had, uh, you know, in between the attacks. And so, you know, this huge overlap with anxiety, you know, led to uh, Dr. Furman's group suggesting this entity called migraine anxiety related disorder, right? But I think it's just basically vestibular migraine and anxiety as well. So, in between the attacks, because you know, very rarely do you encounter a patient, um, you know, during the attack. So between the in between the attacks, you may also find abnormalities on testing. Right, some patients have spontaneous nystagmus, gazy vocal nystagmus, abnormal vehicle, abnormal calorics. Impaired pursuit is fairly common. Um, the trouble with that one is, you know, I'm sure you're all aware, is cooperation is really needed when you're testing pursuit. And so if the patient is already like kind of dizzy, kind of off, you know, excuse me. But that's not as accurate anymore. You know, some patients get, you know, vibration-induced nystagmus, hyperventilation-induced nystagmus. Position nystagmus is fairly common. Um, abnormal BEMPs as well may be found. You know, the data is all over the place, you know, with that. So some describe some findings, some describe other findings. You know, there's nothing very specific thus far. And, um, you know, like we mentioned earlier, some degree of symmetrical hearing loss is also possible. A lot of patients describe triggers for the attacks, you know, and as you can see, there can be some overlap with um, Meniere's disease, right? So like stress, alcohol, caffeine, chocolate, things like that. 
uh, more commonly in people with uh, vestibular migraine, I see would be you know, stress is the biggest one, of course, right? Bright lights is a big one. Um, you know, not enough sleep. Weather changes. You know, as a storm comes in. Um, some people now with the heat, especially the humidity, can do it too. Um, <clears throat> Missing meals, of course, you know, skip a meal that tends to do it for a lot of patients. Um, the dietary triggers, you know, a lot of patients will probably ask you about that, but that accounts for actually a small number of patients in general. I think the big one I always tell patients, you know, be careful with red wine, be careful with caffeine. Can you, must you um, avoid caffeine altogether? The answer is no. One cup per day, like a 12 ounce cup, not the giant venti cups from Starbucks seem to be okay for most people with migraine. Once you start to get two and more cups per day, that's when the migraine um, activity tends to increase. Treatment-wise, you know, for red, there are two big groups that I tell patients about. You have rescue treatments. So those are the stuff you use when you get an attack. And then you have the uh, preventive treatment stuff that you will take every day to reduce the number of attacks that you experience. Um, the trip tents are, uh, you know, pretty useful. You have, you know, seven members of the family. The old one, of course, is Suma trip tent or Inatrex, but you have a lot of others that also can use. Um, they're pretty effective in my experience. Initially, when I first started off seeing dizzy patients, I wasn't very convinced that they would help. Um, to me, I was like, ah, they help with the headache, but they actually do help with uh, vestibular symptoms as well. They're pretty safe, you know. Um, there may be some, you know, like some overzealous pharmacist will tell you if the patient is on um, an antidepressant, they'll say, oh, you can't prescribe a trip that the dreaded serotonin syndrome may happen. That's complete nonsense. So, you know, in the American Headache Society, they did a study, they showed that there is no risk of serotonin syndrome with trip 10 use if you're an antidepressant. Perfectly fine. Some side effects that you can get with the trip tans, you may get some people feel a little hungover afterwards, but the one I warn patients about is the trip tan sensation. So there's this chest pressure, warm feeling in their chest, sometimes going up to their neck, sometimes to the jaw as well. And that one can be a little bit scary. You know, they are already anxious. You know, if they experience that and automatically everyone thinks, oh, hell, I'm having a heart attack. Um, so I warn them about that beforehand. Now, the only time I wouldn't use trip tans is in people with, you know, um, active cardiovascular disease. So, you know, they have a narrowing of the uh, arteries, if they have a history of cabbage, you know, narrowing of the blood vessels in the neck or inside the head, then that's when I don't use the trip plans because there is a small, 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 small risk of vasospasm. The benzodiazepines, um, you know, can be the bane of a lot of uh, physicians, but let's get, let's get real, they do work, right? Um, I don't use Xanax because it's too short acting and because it uh, carries a pretty high risk of addiction because it's short acting. I prefer diazepam, lorazepam, or clonazepam in general. Now, the main thing, of course, is a little bit of drowsiness. And of course, with regular use, one would be concerned about long term cognitive impairment. That's with regular use, high dose, at least three years. The risk of dementia does go up a little bit. Antiemetics, because nausea or vomiting is also pretty common in people with uh, vestibular migraine. You can use promethazine, you can use Zofran or Dancitron. Promethazine usually works a little better by personal experience because, you know, it also targets the yeah, migraine um, pathology. Now, the only drawback with promethazine, of course, sleepiness. Um, steroids, I also do that sometimes. You know, some patients, you know, they do pretty well with just a little medial dose pack. Some pa patients need a higher dosage of, you know, prednisone to help with their um, attacks. Um, NSAIDs, Tylenol, they also can be potentially useful. Again, when I went into it, I swore that, you know, NSAIDs won't work for vertigo, but surprisingly enough, it does work in some people. So you can use Advil, they can use, you know, um, naproxen, you know, um, sometimes with the longer attacks, I use like Mobic, you know, um, see if that can help. Now, the main danger, say, with the uh, pain medications and the triptans is that if you use them too often, how often is too often? More than three days per week, then you are at higher risk of developing medication overuse headache. That's when the medications give them a headache instead. So a lot of patients I've seen come in, they've been taking Tylenol, Advil every single day. Um, I have to have to come to Jesus, talk with them, say, hey, this is what's happened. You're going to suffer for two weeks, but you have to stop these medications basically detox and you will hate me for the next two weeks, but eh, what can we do? That's the only way out of it. Now, meclizine, very commonly prescribed, especially by our ER colleagues. I find it to be really useful, makes people sleepy, can impair central compensation. Eh, I don't really care for meclizine very much. 
Scopolamine, I'm a little careful with it. Um, it can help with motion sickness. It can help some really bad attacks. But the danger is, of course, you know, they start to use it for more than three days and then they take it off. They're going to get rebound, dizziness, and nausea. Cognitive impairment is also possible because of the anticholinergic effects. In fact, you know, they're looking at uh, models of um, dementia. You know, in normal people, what they give them is scopolamine to, you know, induce this type of state. The newer agents, you probably hear about them a little bit. I don't you know, think you all prescribe them because, you know, prior authorizations can be a bit of a pain, fortunately, right? So the G-PANs are what we call the uh, CGR, oral CGRP blockers. Calcitonin gene-related peptide or CGRP is a molecule that's responsible in migraine. It's found all over the body. You know, it covers your vestibular system as well. So there are two oral once there's Ubrogepan or Ubril V, um, Rimegepan or Nertex. So if you look at the ads, you know, TV, Rimegepan, I think they had Khloe Kardashian on one of the, approving one of the, uh, to endorse it. And then they switched to Whoopi Goldberg, I think after that, right? And then the new one, which I cannot pronounce to say in my life, starts with the Z, you can see it there. Um, that is the intranasal version. That would just work, but a uh, few patients complain that it does cause this burning sensation in the back of the throat and numbness as well. Let's is a basically a triptan without the um, cardiovascular risk, right? So the triptans, unfortunately, because they also, the risk of vasospasm is very low because they target the 5-HT1D receptor. So lesmitatan was created as one that only targets the one that is involved in migraine, the 5-HT1F receptor. Now, the trouble is... Um, because of the timing, so they when they launched their product, the FDA had this new rule where they had to test driving ability in patients, and so they found that normal people who took it tend to you know swerve a little bit you know in the in the driving simulator, right? So they have to give this warning: you can't take it from you can't drive eight hours after taking less than ten, and because as we know, you know anything where the patients report a little bit of euphoria, you know the FDA doesn't like us being happy. You know, so they is a controlled substance because of that. So preventive treatments, right? When do we use preventive treatments? So the daily treatments. So these are for recurrent attacks, right? That basically interfere with quality of life, their daily routine, and you know, patients' preference, of course. There's a ton of things we can do, right? You know, there are the non-pharmacological supplements. There's vitamin B2, magnesium, coenzyme Q10, uh, vitamin D, fever fuse and herb. Butterbur is kind of fallen out of favor because there's a risk of um, liver issues with uh, liver toxicity with uh, butterbur. Anti-epileptic medications, I'm sure you've seen all of these. You know, there's Topamax, Lamotrigine, Gabapentin, Zonisamide, Depakote, Lyrica. Beta blockers can be used as well. The tricyclic antidepressant, excuse me, the calcium channel blockers are frequently used. Personally, I really don't like using the calcium channel blockers because of all the side effects. Um, it's an old class of medications, but not, I don't favor them, you know, not my favorite. Um, SSRIs, SNRIs, I frequently use them as well because, you know, as we show, the relationship to anxiety is so close. Um, the ACE inhibitors or the um, receptor blockers, you know, like Istopril and the Sartans also can work. The newer class of the CGRP blockers, they, uh, they come in the monoclonal antibodies. They also have been shown to work. So, <clears throat> damn Rona. So we have, um, excuse me, Erenumab or Amovic, Fermanezumab or Ejovi, Gelfenezumab or Galati. Those are given as shots every uh, four weeks. Epi I can pronounce this, Epitezumab or Biapti, right? That's given as an infusion every three months. And the oral blockers, of course, you have Ramagipan. So you remember earlier, Ramagipan was a rescue medication, but Ramagipan also is used as a preventive medication, right? So you can take it for the attacks or you can take it every other day as a preventive. Etojipan is Culeptum. That's more new. And of course, the benzos, right? Generally, I keep them as a last resort. If you have patients who really don't respond to all the uh, medications listed here, or if they, uh, you know, get side effects to every single thing, I'm sure you all come across such patients. Last resort, sometimes the benzos do work. Of course, lifestyle modification in people with migraine is really important. I tell everyone with migraine, you know, you have a hot, hot brain, right? And so what you need, routine. So avoid sudden triggers, like limit your caffeine intake, processed foods, alcohol, 
stress management can't avoid stress, right? But stress management is important. Sleep hygiene. So, you know, make sure you sleep at regular hours. Wake up at regular hours. Don't take naps when you're not supposed to. Don't stay up too late. <clears throat> Eating regularly, you know, regular portions would be important. Don't suddenly, you know, eat like you know, small amounts. And then one fine day, you decide to eat two bags of chips. Not good, right? Regular exercise also is very, very important. In fact, there have been some studies which show that, you know, regular exercise in sedentary people, whether it's resistance exercise or, you know, aerobic exercise, does help control migraine symptoms. Workplace accommodation is also pretty important. So some people in the workplace, they have a lot of fluorescent lights, a lot of noise. If they sit too close to the windows, computer screens are too big, um, you know, they can try to control for certain things. Like turn on the lights, perhaps, you know, you maybe ask for smaller screens or sit further away from the screens to help, you know, reduce the likelihood of their symptoms being uh, provoked. Uh, the comorbid issues like, you know, uh, mood disorders is very important to treat as well. You know, sometimes, you know, treating, just treating the vestibular migraine symptoms or even the triple PD, even that the mood disorders tend to be problematic, right? Um, and anxiety and depression. And that's usually when I start referring away uh, off to psychology and to psychiatry to help, you know, these patients, right? Most of the time, you know, as you control the source of the anxiety, which is the vestibular migraine, their symptoms, you know, of anxiety and depression tend to start to improve, which is a good thing. Uh, um, cognitive behavioral therapy is an important part, especially in uh, triple PT. So patients basically learn that, you know, certain habits, certain things that they do is not conducive to, um, you know, the uh, condition. So if they start to, okay, feel, all right, I'm getting a little bit dizzy and then the mind goes in the direction where, oh, hell, I'm going to die, I'm going to fall. This is really bad. The end of the world is coming. So in CBT, they're taught, you know, to block that, right? Not let their mind go in that direction. Biofeedback also can be used for that. So they track like your heart rate, certain things in the skin, and then teach patients how to recognize certain physiological markers that something may be happening, um, that their mind is taking them to a bad place and teach them how to pull back. <clears throat> All right. And that's it. <laughs>